Bueno, ahora tenemos a otra soñadora, Irena Ateljevic. La doctora Atel, Ateljevic es académica e investigadora reconocida en el campo del desarrollo sostenible a través del empoderamiento de las comunidades. Ha liderado la Academy of Hope, una iniciativa de académicos y académicas a lo largo del mundo que luchan por integrar principios de aprendizaje a lo largo de la vida en la educación superior. Profesora en la Universidad de Wageningen, perdona Irena, <ríe> ¿eh? en el Grupo de Ciencias Ambientales, ha sido altamente reconocida por su alumnado, habiendo recibido el reconocimiento como mejor profesora del año durante dos años consecutivos. A pesar de este reconocimiento, Irena recientemente ha dejado su puesto profesional en la universidad con el fin de materializar el sueño de su, de su vida en su país de origen, en Croacia. El proyecto se llama Phoenix Arbor. Es un lugar de encuentro inspirador y motivado a la acción para mentes y espíritus abiertos y líderes changemakers emergentes. Irena cree firmemente en conectar teoría y práctica y sus 20 años de experiencia le han llevado a expresar su pasión por la justicia social y el desarrollo humano en numerosos proyectos de transformación económica y social. Estos proyectos le han llevado a lo largo de todo el mundo, desde Croacia, su casa, a Nueva Zelanda, Australia, el Pacífico Sur, China, India, Europa… Vamos, que no ha parado, ¿eh, Irena? <ríe> Conocemos a Irena también desde hace algunos años, ¿eh? Y estamos trabajando conjuntamente con ella para establecer esas redes de soñadores, de change makers, con el fin de tratar que esa unidad y esa suma de fuerzas generen de verdad toda esa fuerza que sabemos que existe y que tenemos que sumar para, para darle una dirección cada vez más potente. Irena, esperamos tu, tus palabras. Life, a miracle in the universe, appeared around four billion years ago. humans only 200,000 years ago. Yet we have succeeded in disrupting the balance that is so essential to life. In 50 years, in a single lifetime, The Earth has been more radically changed than by all previous generations of humanity. We know that the solutions are there today. We all have the power to change. So what are we waiting for? I cannot promise I'm not going to cry uh, this afternoon. I have to say, after this beautiful uh, introduction um, of Adela and, and beautiful organizers of this amazing event, that I think it is going to go into a history of humanity for sure. And I wanted um, to show this video um, to set the frame uh, for my talk to you 
and definitely not a presentation. As I said that very nicely, we are not giving presentation, we are talking to each other. And this video is to, to actually speak um, on behalf of, of our great mother, great mother of earth, that obviously in this video is um, screaming out of the pain. And I think it is this pain that has um, made me to, to uh, step into this um, free fall and um, into the leap, as Victoria was nicely talk, talking about this morning. Um, and I would like to, uh, to highlight that I'm going to talk about this pain as a mother myself as well that is concerned what kind of planet we are leaving to our children. But also as a student and as a teacher who considers teaching as a sacred profession. So um, I'm gonna talk to you about new education and the need for um, revolutionizing or rather um, creating a new evolution for um, education for tomorrow. And the image you see here is the image of my village. Um, where I grew up. And in that village last week, I took these three little stones. And these little stones have been uh, taken from the beach where I stood up um, when I was 18, as a young woman. At that time, and still remains today, um, the options for women were either when you are at 18 to get pregnant and get married or to go to study. And I really had this dream that I had to see the world. I just could not um, stay in the village and to get married, to get pregnant and not to see the world. And on that beach, I actually had this encounter with the, my boyfriend at the time who was really madly in love with me. And he said, please marry me. And I was running away, um, away from him. And I said, no, I have to see the world. And now here I am, exactly 28 years ago. No, 20, I have to do the, the account, I'm 46, so 26, 28 years ago. 20 years ago, I'm back to that same beach. And, and this is the poem that I want to, uh, to dedicate to that beach to this beautiful people here and to this talk. I communicated with her on that beach last week and she talked to me. And this is taken from, uh, actually, uh, she didn't talk in those words, but I think they captured very beautifully. This earth is my sister and my mother. I love her daily grace, her silent daring and how loved I am. How we admire the strength in each other all that we have lost and all that we have suffered, all that we know, we are stunned by this beauty. And I do not forget what she is to me and what I am to her. And this communion with, with our Mother Earth that I have experienced more and more um, as I have progressed through my, uh, through my career is what drives my current dream, as I am actually dreaming in transition. I cannot talk about the success of my dream, but I can connect some dots in my life that can talk about a little dream that now is becoming a big dream and makes sense in my life. And realizing how important it is to have aim in our lives. As one of my most inspiring teachers and authors said, and, and already Rosanna and Adela referred to her, Miral Fassi, she used to speak to her students in her school Everyone of you should have an aim in life, but do not forget that on the quality of your aim will depend the quality of your life. And this is what I now I'm coming to realize, I have an aim. And this is why I had to leave this beach when I was 18. However, I did not manage to see the world immediately. I went to university, um, and then after university when I was 25, I got pregnant, not with the local guy, with the guy that I met at university. And I remember when I was 
pregnant. I came, was seven months pregnant. I came back to my village because I went up north. And everyone in the village was saying, oh, what a shame. You are now pregnant. You can forget about the career. You were such a good student. You were so promising. Now you can forget all about it. You're going to become mother, um, housewife, and forget about changing the world, doing anything for the world. And I still remember that really heavy sinking feeling. Why? Why becoming a mother suddenly is going to affect the way how, uh, what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. And then one very strange paradox came into my life, the war in the former Yugoslavia. As you know, Croatia used to be a former part of Yugoslavia. And the civil war hit us. Um, my daughter, who is here in audience, she was only two. I'm a Croat. My husband was a Bosnian Serb. And it was very difficult to live at the time in Croatia. Uh, suddenly, overnight, although my husband was a very peaceful family man, um, half of my li- village didn't want to talk to me. My father didn't want to talk to me, although I lived up north um, whenever I would come back to the village. And I don't blame them. It was part of their time. It was difficult, difficult time. No rationality. It was a fear. It was a panic. Um, but it was a very difficult time as a young mother. Um, and there was no clear identity to claim. I was very much raised to be a Yugoslavian because the ideology was about brotherhood and funny enough about unity. And I was not aware of national identity of my husband. So I started to look for the options to leave, to get away from that madness because it just hurt too much. And uh, that's, uh, I already uh, finished my master's degree in economics and business administration. At the time, I was openly said that I couldn't get a job because my husband is served. Um, so then I started to look for options, and I got papers for New Zealand, and I moved to New Zealand when I was 27 with my daughter and my husband. Six months later in the country, I got a doctor's scholarship, and uh, it was very difficult again, to, to succeed there on the, on the other side of the world. Um, but I forgot one very important moment that goes back to these little stones on that beach. I went to this beach um, before I left for New Zealand, and I was wondering where I'm going to come back. I was on the one-way ticket to New Zealand, and I still felt such a strong belonging to this land, and I was never sure when I was going to come back. So there I was in New Zealand, very much eager to, to empower myself. I started my, my doctorate in human geography in a critical um, geography, which taught me a very critical way of looking at the world. I was very grateful. My mind started to open amazingly. Um, and I have to say, at that time, education really empowered me amazingly. Um, and it was a tough time, of course, because I had to waitress in, in, the, in the evening to support us. Uh, the, the scholarship was not enough, you know, but I, I was growing. It was, it was exciting time. And my wish came through. I started to see the world. My career took off. I was very successful. I was doing the research in China. I started in China and South Pacific in Fiji. I, I was getting in, invited to... Um, countries all around the world. I really traveled all around the world, the Latin America, Africa. I taught at so many uni- universities. And as I more progressed in my career, as much as I loved it, I started to feel like Victoria was saying something was going wrong. I just, as much as I was empowered, I started to feel there was a particular way of how I had to be um, as a woman in the system that was, again, very much dominated by men and very much by Western Eurocentric colonial perspective. And um, I would like to refer here to Paulo Ferre as a very famous writer on on education, who very much nicely captured this uh, banking system of education that I started to feel in terms of teaching as I was um, pushed into this form of education where I had to approach the student as empty bank accounts. And, and as he captures and tapped into control, thinking and action, uh, leaning men and women to adjust to the world and inhibit their creative power. And especially as, we, as, as the university started to be much more ne- uh, commercialized and part of the neo- neoliberal discourse, um, I realized that the diversity of me as a being woman 
was not really acknowledged. And I think this cartoon really nicely captures as long as we thought as the rest of the system, um, but looking different, um, that was what was important. And this is what is very nicely captured by Ken Robinson, um, who is very well known educationalist and who talks about changing learning paradigms. As I stood up in the classroom, I could really relate to these things that Ken Robinson now famously on TED talks a lot, th talks a lot about. Our universities today, they are so obsessed with um, how much we publish, uh, what is the quantity of our publication. There are so many um, government controls that the teaching really does not um, matter. It's not really the primary function of universities. They are so competitive and they are still based on this industrial revolution heritage, which very much um, takes this assembly line approach to learning and um, domination of mind. It is all about the intellect. And this is what I found increasingly frustrating for uh, 20 years being in the, in the higher education um, I felt that we are neglecting hands, hearts, and arts, and bodies. And as much as the higher education maybe made sense 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years ago to liberate our minds, and as did in my case, I found that in this video, what we have just seen, me standing in the classroom, I have some of my students here, they would come into the classroom and they would ask what we can do about this world. And I just could give them the theories. I could never tell them this is how we should go about it because I was standing in the classroom that sometimes did not even have the rooms. We had these lines that with no flexible chairs. I, as authority, PhD, I am telling you this is how we should change the world. From you know, being invited to every corner in the world, this is how we're gonna do it. This is how sustainability works. And talking, 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 only talk the walk and never walk the talk. And I just couldn't stand it anymore. I just thought, although I, 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 did, I did try, I, I, did, um, I did try to, to address this. My sl slides cannot follow what I'm trying to say from my heart, so it doesn't matter, just ignore it. But this is anyhow the strategy of fear that I already talked. <laughs> so here I am. Anyhow, uh, that just proves how um, you cannot follow your slides. But this is one man that, that has inspired me very much, Theodor Zeldin who also left academia. He's an Oxford University emeritus professor, and he was also the one who, who encouraged me that I should leave the academia. He said to me, they're gonna eat your soul. This is very nice, beautiful quote he, he used. He is teaching a lot on the art of living, and, and, and this is something he said also to BBC, back to the future series, and to, to me in a personal interview, because I had to go to Oxford and talk to him about my frustration in academia. And, and this is beautiful what he said. Nothing can be done without encouragement. What we are concerned about now is how to stimulate the amount of encouragement in the world because all our institutions so far have been discouraging. You go to school and you're told that you're not very good. You go to university and you're given second class degree, not first. And then you are given a job which is not quite the top one. Only few people get to the top. So everything tells you you're not very good. You've got to move to a stage where life is more of an adventure of which one is not afraid. And this was the point where I realized I just have to step out. I tried, I did Academy of Hope for six years. I, I, I tried within the system to promote this idea of educating as the practice of freedom. Bell Hooks is a beautiful uh, black African-American writer who has been written a lot of beautiful books on pedagogy of hope. She inspired me. I have a, here my few beautiful students who helped me with this. We talked about all these critical actions and creative vistas, and I just ran out of esteem. I just felt like uh, we talked uh, earlier at the table, there's an elephant as a symbol of a big system, and there's a flea that is kind of jumping on the elephant, and I felt like a little flea in the, in the system, and I just um, had to step out, and I resigned four months ago. I resigned from my permanent job at Wageningen University. And this is a job for life, it's a security job. Um, I was uh, totally safe for the rest of my life, if you like. Victoria talked about academics, how a lot of academics dream about doing something different 
being caught within the system, but they are trying to do it from the position where they are, from the security and trying to get some funding and trying to, it doesn't work. I, I tried it for a few years. I kept dreaming about Phoenix Arbor and I couldn't get it off the ground as long as I was in the full-time position. So I leaped. No job, no income, nothing. I just leaped. I'm still falling, but I am falling um, into maybe safe hands of my, um, of my uh, beautiful people at the, at the local level. And two of them are actually here with me uh, from my island, Murter, and they seem to be recognizing um, we could do something um, on my island. So I come back to this beach. I come back to those little rocks. I come back to my island. The island that kicked me out uh, 28 years ago virtually kicked me, and I'm coming back to it. I, I feel it very much connected to this land um, that I left so long ago, and I have a dream. This is my dream. My dream is that I want to uh, build this center for new education uh, on my island, the center that would not only provide inspirational meeting grounds for change makers, not only provide a site for uh, lifelong education, not only provide all sorts of different um, educational opportunities to the, um, from the primary level of education to the higher university level, but in doing so also to create this example of community for tomorrow. This uh, island of mine, as an example of a sustainable, innovative island. Uh, I even missed it. There is not written on it. It's the island of Croatia. It's named Murter. Um, and to show how through this center uh, we could, uh, which could serve as a catalyst for creating community for tomorrow that can be sustained by itself, that it can serve as a showcase how we can live in the peace with the earth, how we can look after her, how we can look after her uh, well-being because it is looking after our own uh, well-being. And I think I'm now running out of time to, to talk more about it. And there's so much in my heart I, I would like to share. And, and, and I could talk more about what Phoenix Saba is and about our values, but these things we all share, and, and I think um, they are nothing new to you, so I, I don't think I need to to repeat it, I envisage it to, become, to be social business with consciousness, that we want to walk the talk of sustainability, that this center will be built in harmony with the nature and with the environment, where we're going to work on our vision to action and innovation and all uh, these beautiful words we like to, to express, but I really want to show that it is possible, that I really can walk my talk. So I just want to finish with the key message of Phoenix Arbor. The, 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 the name of Phoenix Arbor is actually inspired by the Latin name for a date tree. Because a date tree takes about 80 years to bear fruit. And for the most part of this time appears as if it is dying. If one does not understand its process, one could easily cut it down. One needs to understand its process. To have an image of what will happen, to know how sweet the fruit it will bear. Phoenix Sabo carries a message of daring to dream and staying strong behind the process that allows a dream to become reality.